DW Inside Europe. Hello and welcome. I'm Kate Laycock in Germany. On today's programme, heated tempers and political comebacks as we look at Pedro Sanchez's deal to retake power in Spain, the Dutch frontrunner who does not want to be Prime Minister, and David Cameron's surprise re-entry into government in the UK. He was forced to resign in failure over a matter of foreign policy. The Prime Minister has looked at each of the 350 MPs sitting opposite and decided that none of them was better at representing Britain's interests on the world stage. All that plus an update on Ukraine's bid for NATO membership. It's going to be a full show. It's official. After months of political gridlock, Spain's former Prime Minister, socialist politician Pedro Sánchez, has been chosen by a majority of legislators to form a new government. Sánchez was backed by 179 lawmakers in the 350-seat lower house of parliament, with only right-wing opposition deputies voting against him. Thursday's vote came after nearly two days of debate among party leaders that centred almost entirely on a highly controversial amnesty deal for Catalan separatists that Sanchez agreed to in return for securing the support of Catalan representatives in Parliament. Our reporter, Ashish Sharma, was outside the Spanish Congress in Madrid as the results of the vote came through. Here's how he described the atmosphere to me. Well, you might be able to uh, hear all around me, there's a huge amount of uh, protest going on. We we are expecting any moment the confirmation that Pedro Sanchez has secured the 179 seats that he needs. And the reason why there's such a huge protest is exactly the coalition that is putting together, because he is bringing, if you like, out of the cold, uh, the Catalan parties which were responsible for the illegal referendum in Catalonia in 2017, which was completely against the Spanish constitution. And the reaction to him forming an alliance with them in order to get the votes, and this is primarily the Junts Catalunya party, which was uh, behind that referendum, uh, is really quite galling for a lot of Spanish people. And as you can probably hear, there are shouts behind me of Viva España, Viva España. Uh, people have also been shouting that, uh, you know, Catalonia is España, don't be fooled by what they say. So, yeah, a lot of strong protests, and it's primarily because uh, of his inclusion of these parties that uh, mainly Spanish people feel have, have broken the constitution and are illegal. Now, this uh, deal, Ashish, it's being done with the help of a new piece of legislation, the amnesty law. Can you explain to me how that's going to work and when it'll come into effect? Yeah, so basically, um, in order to get the votes that he needed to, to, to cross the line, and become the Prime Minister, he needed to really get these Catalan parties. Now, these parties have voted democratically. The the Junts Catalun uh, party has seven seats to offer. uh, And in exchange for their seven seats, what they've basically said is is that we want an amnesty. Uh, Carlos Puigdemont, the leader of uh, Junts Catalun, has been in exile, living in Brussels since 2017, when they held the illegal referendum. He can't come back to Spain because he would be arrested. Various members of his uh, party are still in prison. Others are, are facing uh, you know, charges of uh, illegally breaking the constitution. So the amnesty law has been created in order to pardon all of these people. And once it goes through uh, the legislative process, then within two months, it will be in effect, uh, effective. And it will mean that uh, people like Puigdemont will be able to come back into Spain, uh, those people who are currently serving a prison sentence for their part in the illegal referendum will be released and charges against those who are still pending will all be sort of dropped. And I think that's been the really big difficult uh, thing for a lot of Spanish people to swallow because the idea of seeing Carlos Puigdemont, the man who held an illegal referendum, you know, literally stuck two fingers up at the Spanish constitution, sort of striding back into Spain, not just into Spain, but being a part now of uh, the government is is very difficult for, for people to accept. But that's what the amnesty law is. It's an amnesty. Uh, yesterday, we've had two days of debates. Uh, the Junts Catalan representative was actually quite annoyed with Pedro Sanchez in his, uh, in his speech because he referred to this as a pardon. And they're saying, look, this is not a pardon. What we, what we said and what we did and what we want is exactly that. 
a separate uh, Catalan state. So, uh, you know, the difficult part really happens now. He, he's gotten over the line, but how he's going to keep everything together and deliver on the promises he's made, especially to Junts uh, Catalun, is going to be a very, very interesting bit of uh, political landscaping. Well, indeed. I mean, you've just anticipated my last question there, which is how is Pedro Sanchez likely to govern? Is, is he going to be able to govern effectively? And uh, if so, at what cost? Well, that's, that's the million dollar question, Kate. At what cost and how? Uh, we, we have very little information about the detailed document that was signed between Pedro Sanchez and Junts Catalan Carlos Puigdemont, which was confirmed last week. But we know that they have said things like equal status, uh, all of the tax deficits to be removed. Uh, they want to have a referendum at some point. They want a separate independent Catalan state. Now they're saying that, but I, I feel that if he's able to work a situation whereby he can get them to be equal partners, if you like, within a government, uh, then perhaps he can sort of side skate this issue of an independent Catalonia. Now, to his credit, in the last five years since he's been in charge, there has been a big thawing down of relations uh, with Catalonia. We saw that with the general election in June, where the Socialist Party actually won the majority of the seats. So that in itself has shown a progress because of dialogue that he has instigated, has shown a progress that has kind of staved off this desire for nationalism, independence, uh, that has been sort of uh, uh, throbbing from that region, if you like. And I think he feels confident that he can maintain that dialogue by bringing now that party directly into uh, the government, if you like, he can work with them in a better way and through dialogue achieve the things that he wants uh, without really breaking that constitution. And it has to be done that because for this amnesty law to pass, it cannot be against the constitution because the constitutional jurisdiction will turn around and say, well, if anything happens here that goes against Spain's constitution, then the whole law goes out the window. So it's, it's a very difficult line for him to, to tread, but he will need the, the, the support of Junts Catalan, of the Esquerra Republicana, which is another independent Catalan party that's given its votes to him. Uh, and I think he will be hoping that common sense will prevail because the alternative for all of these groups is the far right and the right wing, and that's never really going to be in their favour. So we, we wait and see. Our Madrid correspondent, Ashish Sharma, there in the thick of it outside the Spanish Congress. And from Pedro Sanchez, a man who demonstrably does very much want to be prime minister, we move to Peter Omtsicht, a man who he says really doesn't. And that is a strange thing, because he's currently the top runner for the job in the Dutch elections, which are now just under a week away. Fernand Van Tetz reports. Hundreds of people are milling around in an event hall. The buzz is palpable. They're all freshly signed up members of New Social Contract, a new political party in the Netherlands that has shot to the top of the polls. The man of the hour is its founder, Peter Omtzigt. I myself, I'm very surprised about the speed at which all this is going. I mean, you're looking at a party um, which had five members three weeks ago. Uh, now we have 7,000. Uh, the first time we meet our members and in two weeks we have an election. Uh, we founded this party less than three months ago. Omsich gained public profile as a bulldog MP who helped expose the child benefit scandal, in which 20,000 people, mostly of colour, saw their benefits revoked, plunging many into debt. He's drawing voters from the right, the left, as well as people who aren't political at all. And now is Ariane Klein. I ran for the first time in 53. My name is Ariane Klein, and at the age of 53, for the first time in my life, I've become a member of a political party. The past few years, I've seen that Peter Umzingt and a number of other people who are not members looked very carefully and for a long time at things that aren't going well in our country, and that they are really trying to change the system. So they aren't just shouting one thing, but really looking at how we can change basic themes like proper governance and the cost of living, and want to make a start with that, but also say, we need time for that. The party's main issues are constitutional reform and the cost of living, which he has managed to make one of the big issues of this campaign, in addition to the housing crisis and migration. 
more than 100,000 migrants is too much. So we want to lower that to about 50,000. And then we're talking about limiting both migration from study. 40% of the new first year students at Dutch universities come from abroad and then go back because we teach in English. Secondly, we've got a large number of um, migrant workers, both from within Europe and outside Europe. And some of the tax advantages they get are so high that, well, we can't blame them that they come. But we're going to rebalance that a little bit. And thirdly, um, asylum migration, we will follow more of the policies like, for instance, what happened with the deal in Germany over the last week. Despite leading the polls, Omtich says he doesn't want to become prime minister. I have a very firm preference to stay within the Dutch parliament where I have been for 19 years so far. His main opponent is Dylan Jezielgus, who has succeeded current Prime Minister Mark Rutte as head of the Liberal VVD. Jezielgus has brandished her tough credentials, with campaign videos showing her boxing with heavyweight champion Rico Verhoeven and lifting weights in stilettos. If her party becomes the biggest, she could become the first female Prime Minister of the Netherlands. Frans Timmermans, the former Euro Commissioner, is leading a new joint list of Labour and the Greens. He is hoping to bring the left back to power for the first time in two decades. If we don't become the biggest party, then there'll be a right-wing coalition. Then I won't be able to increase the minimum wage. Then I won't be able to make childcare free. Then I won't be able to make sure that polluters pay. With a record 26 parties running, any winner will need to form a coalition. With less than a week to go, more than half of voters remain undecided. This is Fanon Van Tetz, DW, The Netherlands. It's been a week of high political drama in the UK as well, following the sacking of the controversial hardliner Suella Braverman as Foreign Secretary and her replacement in a dramatic cabinet reshuffle by none other than David Cameron, the former UK Prime Minister whose brand of politics was once dubbed compassionate conservatism. Mr Cameron is a controversial figure associated with cutting Britain's public purse and approving a Brexit referendum. But he's also seen as a centrist and was in favour of remaining in the EU. So, the question is, what does his appointment really mean? Dan Ashby has been figuring it out. Um, I'm a bit tired, but I don't think I've had a funny turn. But let me just tell you what's just happened. David Cameron has just walked up the street and gone into 10 Downing Street. It was an entrance so surprising that reporters wondered if they could believe their eyes. But this week, the former UK Prime Minister David Cameron walked back into British government seven years after he left it altogether. Even Rishi Sunak, the current UK Prime Minister, nodded to how strange it was. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome, especially a warm welcome to those for whom it's their first cabinet and also a welcome to those for whom it may not be their first time. Uh, <laughs> lovely to have you, lovely to have you all here. Now, our, our purpose is... So who is David Cameron? As dawn rose, uh, a new light, a bluer light, fell across our aisles. He was the one-time darling of the UK's right-wing Conservative Party, promising a new, compassionate conservatism that included gay rights, environmentalism and a strong economy. In short, he was considered a centrist. The vast majority of people aren't obsessives, arguing at the extremes of the debate. Let me put it as simply as I can. Britain and Twitter, they're not the same thing. Zoe Crowther is a reporter for Politics Home, and I asked her what Cameron's return means. Should the rest of the world look at the return of David Cameron as a return to centrist, old-fashioned conservative politics, or is, is this much more just about strategy, an upcoming election? It's difficult to say at the moment. I mean, it's, I don't think there's much evidence to show in the last few months that the government itself is moving kind of radically back towards the centre ground. The government's still trying to really put across that it's going to be strong on kind of stopping the boats, crossing the channel and all that kind of rhetoric that it wants to be tough on crime. I don't think we're going to see a shift away from those policies as such. I think it's it's more of a political, strategic decision as to appealing to different areas of the party. But his return is a risk. 
he's associated with calling the Brexit referendum, which led to his own resignation. I love this country and I feel honoured to have served it. And I will do everything I can in future to help this great country succeed. Thank you very much. The opposition Labour Party's David Lammy says Cameron's return shows the government is out of ideas. Mr Speaker, David Cameron is the seventh Foreign Secretary in the seven years of Tory chaos. He was forced to resign in failure over a matter of foreign policy. The Prime Minister has looked at each of the 350 MPs sitting opposite and decided that none of them was better at representing Britain's interests on the world stage. But with an intray of Gaza, Ukraine and EU negotiations, might it help having a former Prime Minister as Foreign Secretary? Dr Steve McCabe is a leading politics academic. David Cameron, quite clearly, um, you know, he is an ex-Prime Minister. Um, and indeed, I was thinking about this the other day, there are quite a number of uh, former Prime Ministers kicking around in the Tory party. Um, but he is the sort of the last one of what might be regarded as a, um, an administration that had um, stability. Um, Cameron, he comes as a sort of Prime Minister who had some degree of success. Mr Cameron famously sang to himself after resigning in front of world cameras. Right. Now he will aim to get the world to dance to his tune. And the question? Will he find harmony or go off key? Dan Ashby, DW, in the UK. So much happening in European politics at the moment. To stay abreast of it all, make sure that you're subscribed to Inside Europe wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Kate Laycock in Germany. You're listening to Inside Europe. This week, the thorny question of Ukraine's bid to join NATO was given new and unexpected impetus. NATO first promised Ukraine that it was on a path to membership back in 2008, but that long-standing pledge got more complicated with Russia's invasions of the country and its occupation of Ukrainian territory. As Terry Schultz reports from Brussels, there is renewed buzz around the membership question and not all of it is positive. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky's request to join NATO as soon as possible has been blocked in part because Russian troops occupy some Ukrainian territory and allies have no appetite for a built-in conflict with the Kremlin. But last week, former NATO chief Anders Fogh Rasmussen went public with a proposal that had until now been pondered primarily in private, offering Ukraine NATO membership without regaining Crimea, Donbass, and the other territories Russian President Vladimir Putin has illegally seized. In tweets and interviews, Rasmussen argues that if Ukraine were covered by NATO's collective security guarantee, Article 5, it would deter further Russian expansion. But even some leaders who advocate Ukraine's rapid NATO accession aren't enthusiastic about Rasmussen's proposal, given current circumstances on the ground. Lithuanian Foreign Minister Gabrielius Landsbergis is among them. Any sort of ceasefire, any sort of negotiations is a lead up to a victory day in Moscow. Putin has been, uh, has been very clearly pushing, pushing for that. Notions of giving away territory, they do go against international law. I mean, territorial integrity is something you know, that has to be sacrosanct. Giving away something for something, it should not, be, you know, it sh it should not work like this. Ukrainian parliamentarian Andriy Osadchuk says it's a non-starter for Kyiv. Any ceasefire, any freezing of the conflict, any compromise with evil, just give a time for Russia to reload. It's a very, very big mistake if anyone thinks that Kremlin want to negotiate anything about these territories, at least for the moment. They still believe that they can swallow all Ukraine slowly, slowly, you know, like a big snake. And only lack of readiness of the West to fight 
not for Ukraine, to fight for the West, is giving all these experts a ground for such a amazing ideas, which has nothing to do with reality at all. This isn't the first time such an idea has emerged from the realm of rumors. In August, the chief of staff of Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg, Stian Jensen, was speaking at a forum in Norway and suggested in Norwegian that Ukraine giving up some Russian-occupied land may be a path to peace. When these comments made it to the international press, they caused an immediate uproar in Kyiv and among some allies. Within 24 hours, Stoltenberg had to reconfirm that NATO supports Ukraine regaining its territorial integrity, and Stan Jensen had to say he'd misspoken. Defense analyst Edward Hunter Christie, a former NATO official, says mistakes are indeed being made with Ukraine, and not just in words, but in deeds. There is a gap between official positions, which express the ideal outcome of Ukraine recovering its entire territory, and the actual level of aid, of military aid in particular, that allies are prepared to give. Systematically, our governments have slow walked military assistance to Ukraine. It is quite extraordinary and frankly bizarre that while on the one hand, diplomatically, our position is that Crimea is Ukraine and Ukraine has the right to recover its entire territory, at the same time, we've steadily refused to give them longer range weapons. They need the full range of tools so that they have a real chance of changing facts on the ground. And then we can see where diplomacy leads. Hunter Christie notes there's no reasonable explanation for how the Article 5 security guarantees that come with NATO membership would work for a partially occupied Ukraine. Huge, there's a huge credibility problem. Because if you look at military assistance from the West to Ukraine so far, it was made quite clear at, se- at several mo- key moments that uh, Western allies did not want to place their own forces onto Ukrainian territory. So why should the Ukrainians or anyone else believe that allies would now give Ukraine sufficient guarantees, which would entail having an allied force presence on the free territory of Ukraine in order to properly guarantee its security. In principle, there's nothing, nothing that ought to prevent having whatever part of Ukraine we could have fully into NATO. But again, our commitment is to restore the full territory of Ukraine and strategically and militarily and legally and for the international reputation and prestige of the alliance, we need to go all the way with this. But all the way to regaining the occupied regions is still such a long way off that Ukraine and its supporters fear weapons deliveries already flagging will dry up a long time before they get there, forcing President Zelensky to consider giving up pieces of his country and calling it a peace deal. Terry Schultz, DW, Brussels. Now, just time for... The results of last week's Spotify poll are in and it seems as though there's quite a bit of listener demand for both more culture content and themed specials. So it's been noted. Thank you very much for taking part. A tech question this week. The world's first large-scale electronic computer was called Colossus. When and where did it first go into use? Was it 1944 in Bletchley Park, UK, 1945, University of Pennsylvania, USA, or 1946, Moscow State University, USSR? Head over to Spotify to take part in the poll. Just time for a quick reminder of our feedback address, Inside Europe at DW.com. This is Inside Europe, and I'm Kate Laycock in Germany.
This is Inside Europe with me, Kate Laycock. Thursday, November 16th marked the International Day for Tolerance and in honour of that event, we're dedicating much of the upcoming half hour to that very topic. We'll be hearing from an interface initiative in Paris, a living library event in Dusseldorf, do I have to sign for her? <laughs> no, no, not, not no, at the moment. No. Me. I can just borrow you. Just borrow okay, I'll give her back, I promise. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> you can go with us if you want. And an intersection of migration journeys in Serbia. All that plus a roundup of all that was hot at the world's largest tech summit held this week in Lisbon. From Bonn, Germany, you're listening to Inside Europe. We begin our International Day of Tolerance-themed section of the show in Ries Orangis, a Parisian suburb sometimes nicknamed Little Jerusalem because it is home to a substantial number of Jewish residents. According to the French government, more than 1,500 anti-Semitic acts have been registered in the country since the outbreak of war between Hamas and Israel back in October, so tensions are running high in the neighbourhood. One initiative, however, is bringing Muslims and Jews together in an attempt to calm things down and build community across the culture divide. Lisa Louis reports. Du comme il a dit Monsieur Sarfati, c'est un jeu de mots. Du coup, on avait dit le mouton peut le remplacer par quel mot? Half a dozen young people are gathering at a parking lot around a van on a recent Tuesday morning. The vehicle is covered with stickers featuring slogans such as We are more alike than it seems. This is a workshop organized by the Group for Jewish-Muslim Friendship, which includes Jews and Muslims, and advocates for friendship between the communities. The youngsters are learning to reassess some of their prejudices. Thibault, who is holding the workshop, asks the young people what ages means. To discriminate against someone because of their age, one participant answers. The initiative was set up 20 years ago by Rabbi Michel Serfati, who is also attending this particular workshop. Our initiative was founded to fight against two forms of racism, anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. We raise awareness amongst young people in an indirect way. By making them more aware of discrimination, we make sure they don't fall into the trap of anti-Semitism. Today's participants, some of them Muslims, others Christians, tell me such workshops have opened their eyes. I always thought that Jewish people kept to themselves, partly because I didn't know any Jews. I've realized there was a prejudice and that you shouldn't judge people without knowing them. I now understand that just because some people from different religions in France don't get along right now, it doesn't mean that we can't get along here. In this area, people from different religions do indeed literally live side by side, with a synagogue, a church and a mosque right next to each other. That's why Rabbi Serfati calls the area Little Jerusalem. As he walks along the pavement after the workshop, he comes across local imam Hajj Muloit Iluazia. As they talk, another member from the Muslim community on a bike stops to greet the rabbi. Then the imam takes us all to the mosque, a blue prayer room, where just minutes ago dozens of believers had gathered for the midday prayer. Imam Mouloid Iloazia tells me how deep the friendship between the communities runs. It's only because of Rabbi Serfati's help that we could open our mosque in this street 20 years ago. He called the mayor on our behalf and said, there's a building available here. The mayor asked him, are you not afraid of the Muslims? Mr. Serfati said, no, on the contrary, we want them to be close to us so that we can be friends, neighbors and brothers. The rabbi, imam and Christian leaders regularly organize joint events in Ries Orangis. Right after the start of the current conflict between Israel and Hamas, they gathered to mourn the dead together. But across France, regular demonstrations in support of Israel or the Palestinians have shown how tense the situation is. Anti-Semitic acts have skyrocketed to more than 1,500 in just a few weeks. 
his Interior Minister Gérald Darmanin, in a recent interview with French broadcaster France 2. We are doing what's necessary to protect Jews in France. 10,000 police and soldiers are protecting 900 synagogues and schools. And despite the unity in the little community of Riz Orangis, Rabbi Serfati says he's deeply worried about the future as he shows me around the synagogue. Nous sommes en train de nous interroger sur notre place dans le monde. We are wondering about our place in the world. The massive demonstrations in the Muslim world, where people were yelling, death to the Jews, death to Israel, Israel assassin, begs a question for humanity. Will humanity assume its responsibility for the minority of 20 million Jews or not? Rabbi Serfati is nevertheless hoping that his community's example of religious coexistence can show the way, so that the two sides can find some common ground. Lisa Louis, DW, Gris Orangis. And in continuation of that theme of intercultural dialogue, here is something that I recorded earlier. So I've actually nipped out on a break uh, to my local library, the International English Library in Dusseldorf. And I am here because, in connection with the International Day of Tolerance happening this week, they are hosting a living book event. Now, I'm not quite sure what to expect, but I've been told that there is someone up here who's going to tell me more. So here we go. Hello. <laughs> Is it you that I need to talk to if I want to check out a living book? I, I would think so, yes. I'm Eira Mehic. I am a student at the Heinrich Heine University in Düsseldorf. I study sociology and history, and I also volunteer at the International English Library and at the Kulturreferat at my university. So I'm so excited about this. I have never in my life checked out a living book, so you have to explain to me a bit about the concept. What, what's going on here? What can I expect? Okay, so the concept we borrowed from uh, the idea of a human library that was first realized in Denmark in 2001 as a way to let people face their prejudices and stereotypes in person and to deconstruct these through constructive dialogue. I believe each person has a story worth telling and that by telling these stories we can foster empathy and understanding and so also solidarity and tolerance. So this was the idea behind our International Living Library, as we now call it. And I believe that there is a genuine, real-life living book in the library today, and I'm going to be allowed to have a, a sort of an advanced loan. I can check her out for a conversation. Yes, exactly. Um, this living book's title is In Between, Perception Makes Reality. I'm so excited. So can you maybe introduce me to the living but it's awful i'm going to learn her name in a minute and live a living book mm -hmm. and help me to check her out i've never done this before yes you walk sure. me through it yeah okay right let's go find her um right she's not in the crime section that's a relief <laughs> <laughs> where's she gonna be um i think she would probably be she's there yeah <laughs> yes. it's like a blind date hello yeah. Yeah. it sounds <laughs> exciting it is Hi. lovely to meet you lovely to meet you too. but i have to sign for her <laughs> No, 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 not no, at the moment. No. I can just borrow you. Just borrow okay, I'll give her back, I promise. I promise. <laughs> What's your name? Diana. Diana. Oh, Diana. Oh. Last name? Chernyavska. Is it going to be a, U a Ukrainian? It's Ukrainian. 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 It's Ukrainian last name. I've got a Ukrainian book. Um, I think you've got Ukrainian international book. Oh, Okay. So when I read a book, mm -hmm. I always skip the introduction. I'm really impatient. But the, the bit that I always read first, it's the dedication. You know, that little thing at the beginning where the author writes a little message to someone who's important to them, someone who's influenced them. If you had a dedication, what would it be? Oh, it makes me cry now, probably. Um, I never thought about that. But, um, yeah, I would say that it's dedicated to Evibdus, Evibdus team, International Women in Business in Dusseldorf. Great women I've met here when I joined the organization. Ah, okay. So this is going to be a story of female empowerment and, and support. mutual support and support. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, okay. Oh, I feel like we skipped to the end. Hang on, wait, wait. Let's, let's, let, me, let, me, let me get a grasp on the beginning. Okay, so your story. Mm-hmm. If you had to choose a moment where your story begins, like a, a memory, something that, yeah, that set you off. Yeah, it was um, last year during the summer. And it was a very dark period of time for me uh, due to different reasons. There's a war in my country. We've done lots of volunteers' projects, and uh, I stopped my consultancy business, and I stopped working for the corporate world, and uh, there was an advertisement about talent fair for international women who are looking for a job or would like to get back to workforce. And I was thinking, "Mm, maybe it's not for me, maybe I'm too old not qualified, overqualified, underqualified, like all the reasons, like I'm from Ukraine, it's a third country, my English is not perfect, like probably I should not go there. And I was among 10 fantastic women who were on a stage last year, don't remember exact months, probably it was October, September, and we presented our stories in five minutes. I'm just so fascinated that this is happening this is happening against the backdrop of war in your country. It was even difficult to go on a stage and to allow myself to go there because we all live in abroad. We have this guilt that we live in our normal life and people are dying there. So it was just like a big internal debate. Are you in touch with businesses in the Ukraine at the moment? Yeah, I'm working on a project. It's a European Union project, European Commission project, and uh, I'm supporting um, one of the state uh, institution with uh, developing the competencies for the professional area. And I have to admit that the level of acceptance and the level of willingness to change among regular employees is very high. That's so interesting, because when you think of a war economy, you automatically associate that with a lack of freedom, right? A lack of choice. But actually, I mean, I I was reading an article the other day about um, uh, the Ukraine military encouraging people to actually volunteer and to apply to specific posts where they think that their skill set is going to flourish. This is something that you Mm recognise. This is happening within... within I cannot say for the whole Ukraine because I've been living here for eight years. And I don't believe that I can judge or evaluate what is happening there because I'm not there. I can only share the skills the knowledge, encourage and support them. But that in-between space, it must also be an emotional space. We all feel lonely at the beginning because we are still there in our homeland, but we live now in present time in a new country. While we're in a place of vulnerability, could I ask you, what's the darkest chapter of this book? Mm, When you have no power. Um, Have you watched uh, Harry Potter? Yeah. Do you remember when Damon uh, came and they just suck out the whole energy from you? Dementors. Dementors, yeah, not Yeah, Dementors, exactly. So this is the darkest side. And uh, the darkest side is when you do not believe that your life is worth living further. The people in Ukraine that you're working with at the moment, do you think that they're plagued by Dementors? Oh, I think they're very strong, like, I've been there already two times for the last six months. And I always amazed with their courage and their... I'm not talking about everyone. We have to be very clear about that because I don't want to generalize. I work with a specific group of people working in one institution. They really love what they're doing. They have a professional connection. They have something bigger than them. They wake up every day, they go to work, they do work, they develop themselves. Is it going to be a happy ending? How does this book end? Of course it's going to be the happy ending. Uh, Everyone will find their tribe and they will find the group they belong and they will still will be able to protect their own values, their strength and their individuality or their authenticity. Well, that would be a lovely ending to this story, Diana. But I saw you rummaging in your bag earlier, and I think that you might have one last surprise for me. Uh, okay, you will, you will, you will, you will see what it is. Okay. So you need to pick up is one from the glass from, oh, the, okay. from the mug. Just oh, it's like up, a lucky dip. Up. Okay, so I'm putting, yeah. putting my hand into into a mug, and oh, it's like a bead. A bead? Is it a bead? 
Oh. You can put it in a jar. Yeah. And it will grow. <gasps> it's a seed. It's a seed. Yes, it's exactly. It's <gasps> a seed. It's, it's got a sunflower in it, but it's not it's a sunflower a sun- seed. It's not it? a sunflower, but it's a sunflower. So it's a very symbolic, because I would say that when I've met you, when I've heard you, you sounds like a sunflower. You're very shiny and very bright and very warm and very huggable. <laughs> That's beautiful. Thank you so much. And I turn towards the light. Yeah. Exactly. (laughs) There is one trip to the library that I will not be forgetting in a hurry. Dusseldorf International English Library, by the way, has an excellent social media presence. So do check it out if you want to see pictures of the Living Library event or find out more about Diana or any of the other living books. Now, to an unlikely crossing of migration paths, Russians and Burundians who have become stranded in Serbia. Generally, the Russian diaspora in the wake of the war in Ukraine has been a wealthy cohort, but around 100 families have ended up in Serbian asylum camps alongside migrants from the global south, many of them from the East African country of Burundi. As they wait in limbo in Serbia, the two main groups have forged friendships, although they are bracing for a tough winter ahead in the camps. Camilla Bell-Davies has been speaking to people from both groups and has changed their names for security reasons. At an NGO in downtown Belgrade, a family of Burundians and Russians are having their daily free Serbian lesson. Among them is Shamim, who left Burundi, one of the world's poorest countries, to travel to Belgrade last year. Next to him are Andre and Irina, a Russian couple who left their apartment in St. Petersburg and ended up here too. It's a unique convergence point where the effects of two of Europe's most pressing challenges intersect, mass migration from the global south and the consequences of the Ukraine war. I'm meeting Irina, Andre and Shamim at the NGO where migrants come to get free language lessons because getting an official access permit to the out-of-town asylum camps where they live is tricky. My family and I came to Serbia because they wanted to draft my husband into the military. I was born in Ukraine, though my husband and kids were born in Russia. It felt difficult to be in a country that was going to war on my family. The city that I lived in in Ukraine has been completely destroyed. Serbia was the cheapest visa-free country we could escape to quickly. We took three planes. We didn't know anything when we came, that there is visa-free access here. We sought asylum. We didn't know what would happen to us. Andre and Irina didn't know that Russians can enter Serbia without a visa and stay for 90 days, as many have done. They also didn't have enough money to rent an apartment. This is unusual, as most Russians in Belgrade have become known for pushing up rental prices with their high salaries. Instead, the pair applied for asylum on arrival and ended up being taken to the asylum seekers' camp. When Shamim left Burundi on a tourist visa granted by Serbia after the small African nation renounced recognition of Kosovo independence, he initially tried to find guest houses, but was eventually directed to the same camp where he too sought asylum. Or in the camp, or the condition, they, they can't be okay. Well, for that everything it's okay, but they like you want, you can't get that. Since their arrival, the camp residents have been waiting in limbo for approval of their asylum claims, after which they can receive work permits. The Russians have learnt French from the Burundians, and some families have forged friendships. Relationships have blossomed between singletons. Still, there is little to do but find cash-in-hand jobs and wait for better days. It's going very slow. It's pretty bad. I currently can't do anything. I don't have my asylum status resolved yet, so I can't work. Actually, I want to leave, to carry on the journey to another country, to France, maybe America, Europe. And with the Russian passport, it's getting more difficult, obviously, to get into European countries. Many of the Burundians in the camp have also tried to move on to EU countries. Like the Russians, they view Serbia as a transient stop on their journey through the Balkans to Western Europe, 
rather than a destination for long-term integration. In fact, Serbia has come under fire for its inability to police its borders effectively after people traffickers were found pushing thousands of migrants over Hungarian and Croatian borders. Besides Russians and Burundians, Serbia previously maintained visa-free arrangements with Cuba, Tunisia, Afghanistan and Iran as rewards for those countries denouncing Kosovo's independence. The EU eventually pressured Serbia to terminate all these provisions as migrants spilled into the bloc. And in May last year, the EU threatened to revoke Serbia's visa-free access to Europe if it passed a controversial law granting Serbian passports after one year of residency, a move widely seized on by migrant Russians hoping to gain access to the EU. Though there are opportunities and labour gaps to fill in Serbia, migrants say they don't always feel safe here and dream of the EU. Such fears are not unfounded. Serbia has a virulent right wing. Far-right politicians and football hooligans are aggressively resistant to the migrant presence in Serbia. The Wagner-supporting People's Patrol group have called for migrant hunts and protested outside the camps. Recently, these groups, which tend to be pro-Kremlin, have also targeted Russian draft dodgers in Serbia, posting their photos online with labels such as liberal traitors. A Russian-Ukrainian couple were verbally attacked and harassed by their neighbours, with Z symbols painted on their door. So far, Irina hasn't had problems, and she said people are friendly. But she also finds it hard to accept when people here support Putin. While desperate and hopeful people pile up in Serbia, lured by its visa-free access and hoping to reach the EU, Irina, Andre, and Shamim are contemplating another winter here. And after some thoughts about France, Shamim has decided he may want to stay. It's um, so beautiful and so amazing because when I was here, it's like um, I am at home. Also, I can say Serbian for now is more better than French. In French, I was learning French before I started the school. Not long ago, Shamim received his asylum claim and work permit. He's just about to move out of the camp where he had forged friendships. He put on a photography exhibition and the Russian families at the NGO attended. Yeah, it was so amazing and uh, <laughs> it was like a surprise to, to see all our teachers, they come to, to support me. In the meantime, Irina knows she and her family will have to face another winter in the camp. She dreads being stuck in limbo forever. Still, she says, I will never go back to Russia. No, no, no. That report from Camilla Bell Davies there. DW is part of the Info Migrants Network, providing migrants to Europe with information at every step of their journey. Find out more at infomigrants.net. I'm Kate Laycock in Germany. You're listening to Inside Europe. The world's largest technology event, rather unoriginally titled Web Summit, took place in the Portuguese capital Lisbon this week. Having got off to a rocky start, the event's founder had to resign as CEO just weeks before the start date after major companies started withdrawing in protest against controversial remarks that he'd made on the platform formerly known as Twitter. The Web Summit succeeded in attracting over 70,000 guests from 153 countries, as well as a star-studded palette of big-name speakers. DW's Alex Matthews was there in the thick of it, as he told me on the line from his Lisbon hotel room. Yeah, it's it's very big. It takes you about 15 minutes to walk from one end of the hall to the other. So it's split up into different, they're called pavilions. And then there's all different stages and stands and everything else within these different pavilions. And you have to do a lot of weaving through crowds. And when you want to go to a panel discussion and sit and watch, you have to sometimes take some time to be able to find a seat. So there's plenty going on. The rooms are loud. There's lots of discussion happening. 
And certainly the number one discussion that's taking place is AI and in particular generative AI, artificial intelligence. So that's why we're talking about, you know, AI that can generate text and images and other outputs based on the data that it was trained on. You know, if you're talking to people, if you're talking to startups, whether they're healthcare startups, financial startups, gaming, security, you've got legal services or people offering all sorts of uses, they'll be telling you how their product is based largely on generative AI or uses AI to help you. There's panels about different regions of the world. So I sat in one where people were talking about how Africa should be at the forefront of development, for example. Uh, aerospace company Airbus were demonstrating how it uses AI to measure and predict pilots' response times during flying. Uh, there's obviously the dangers of AI, generative AI, what it can mean for a potential flood of misinformation, disinformation that's going to be generated by AI. We can already see now really realistic images that you can generate using AI, um, and it's quite difficult to know whether they're real or not, and the possibilities that this might lead to in the future. So there's lots of people trying to see into the future with AI. There's lots of people talking about it, and um, lots of people debating questions surrounding regulation. How much regulation does it need? Who should be the people who are introducing this regulation? Should it be the AI companies themselves? Should it be governments looking at it? And if it is governments, how do they, from a tech perspective, not strangle development too much, I'd say, is the the major concern of, of lots of people here. Okay. Listen, Alex, I'd just like to switch topics quickly at this point and talk about the Ukrainian presence at the summit. I noticed that one Vladimir Klitschko was on the billing. Yeah, so I've seen Vladimir Klitschko walking around a lot. He was on the main stage on the opening day talking about the war in Ukraine. He is, of course, the former two-time heavyweight world boxing champion who is Ukrainian and his brother is the mayor of Kiev and he himself is involved in what's called digital Kiev. So Ukraine, despite the war, is trying to build its tech sector, show off its tech sector, show people that it's worth investing in Ukraine. Obviously, it's an extra way to generate revenue, but it's also a Ukrainian push, I think, to show the world how valuable Ukraine can be and show Europe how valuable Ukraine can be to, I think, try and put a bit of pressure on to say, you know, you've told us we can join the European Union. This is what we have to offer. It is a lot. You really should push to allow us to join as soon as possible. Mm, That's really interesting. Finally, Alex, what about your personal takeaway when you arrive back in Deutsche Welle? What sort of nugget of knowledge or key sort of revelation are you going to be bringing with you? Yeah, I mean, I hate to drag it back to AI again, but I'm going to have to. The rate at which things are being developed, the speed at which AI is being adopted in so many different areas, it is going to massively change our lives and change the way that we work. And I think leading from that, I'll I'll be going back and thinking, well, how are we going to be able to harness this properly in the way that so many people are promising so that we can get it right? It's I guess it's a bit of a cliche, but only time will tell how well we're able to manage this transition into a, a generative AI world. But um, it's exciting. And also there are a few worries there as well. DW's Alex Matthews there, whose official title is editor to the editor in chief. This programme was produced by Helen Sini with help from me, Kate Laycock and sound engineer Jan Winkelmann. Inside Europe comes to you from DW in Bonn, Germany.